And I think that is the default mistake that a lot of us in inverted commas can make. It's easy to look at plyometric work and to fall into the same reps and sets and intensities that we use for back squat and power cleans, you know, because it's relatively easy to do. You know, if we're talking about things like reactive strength and jump mats or force plates or whatever, you can measure it. It's measurable. So it's very easy. And I've definitely been very guilty of it. And I think I probably continue to be. It's very easy to fall into that, right? I'm, I'm going straight to the realization phase. I'm going to do these plyometrics. I'm going to do them hard. I'm going to measure them and I'm going to show progression over time. That is, I think, where you become likely to fall into that trap you described at the beginning of this conversation where you're just training for the test and you're just winding yourself up into a state of tension that isn't actually particularly productive or transferable into the sport. That was Iman Flanagan, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Before we get to the show today, I wanted to mention a really cool item that is available now from our sponsor, SimplyFaster.com, in their store. That item is Exogen Premium Wearable Resistance. Exogen is a series of tight-fitting sleeves along with uniquely shaped fusiform weights that strap directly onto those sleeves. So what I mean is you can have shin sleeves, arm sleeves, shorts, and a vest, and you can strap these uniquely fusiform-shaped weights They're light in nature, 100, 200 grams, that strap on in a way that allows you not only to resist movement very specifically, but also add fine-tuned elements of rotation to that resistance. So this is the next level of wearable resistance. You may have heard this from back long ago on the show, Hank Kreienhoff talking about it, to recently Chris Corfis, sprint coach, talking about it. This is the next level in premium wearable resistance. I've used it myself. I love it. I love not only the way it feels and the way you feel form and technique change. It's like combining technique with power. And so often we just think about weighted vests as just pure force, pure downward gravity loaded resistance. This is the ultimate combination of technique with power. And it shows up in things like Chris Corfis being able to take time off an athlete's 10 meter fly by putting the sleeves just on one side of the body and ipsilateral resistance. We're using the body's own systems fine-tuning it. And that's what this does. It allows you as the coach or an athlete to create, explore, and fine-tune the way that the resistance is rotationally impacting the body. This is next level stuff, and I know you'll love it. So you can check that out in the Simply Faster store. Head on over to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com, and get your exogen gear today. Welcome to another episode. Jump training in plyometrics has been a longtime passion of mine as an athlete and eventually coach. Uh, It's something that I always enjoy opening my mind to new ideas or expanded ideas and other people's thoughts and philosophies on it, even now after having gone through several decades of plyometrics and depth jumps, bounding, and various um, ideas when it comes to making athletes better for their sport. From a track and field background, it's always been a little bit, I guess you could say reductionist or very simple, just jump higher, jump further. When it comes to sport and deducing things beyond just being able to dunk on someone better or flip over an opponent to the make a touchdown and get into uh, filling in gaps in an athlete's uh, maybe athletic profile, see if there's elements that they might be down on in terms of being a low-hanging fruit that either is holding them back from performance or perhaps predisposing them to an injury. That is the part that I've become been catching up on, you could say, the last decade or so. To that end, I'm really excited to have Eamon Flanagan on the show today. Eamon is the lead strength and conditioning consultant with the Sport Ireland Institute, where he manages strength and conditioning support for Ireland's Olympic and Paralympic athletes. Uh, Amongst his many areas of expertise, Eamon is a leading coach in both the science and practice of jump training and plyometrics. He has a PhD in sports biomechanics and has previously worked in professional rugby for over a decade. One of the things that I'm really excited about talking with Eamon today is regarding the hands he has in the buckets of both uh, the intuitive art of coaching plyometrics, giving athletes what they need to reach a higher performance potential from just a pure coaching standpoint, but also a hand in the bucket of looking at things more quantitatively from more of a database standpoint, using force plates and those th- types of testing markers, or just things like standing broad jump, depending on what you have available. But he using that in context of being a good coach and not just using data for data's sake and whether you are a force plate user and have an expensive training lab or all you have is a tape measure and that's it. 
this podcast has tons of stuff for you to use. Um, even I love that Eamon doesn't get too far into unnecessary data, but always keeps it in context of the grand scheme of being a great coach and using that to become a better analyst of what athletes truly need. In this talk today, Eamon talks about plyometrics, jump testing, uh, single versus double leg metrics, optimally prescribing and periodizing a plyometric program or different, his, he sees different phases of a plyometric program over the year and how to not dig too deep into a single metric. Again, a really great show, whether you're an athlete, a coach, whether you have a sports science lab or just simple means, this was an awesome show and it was great talking to Eamon. Let's get on to it. Eamon, welcome to the show, man. It's it's great to have you here. I'm excited to have like a plyometric and jumping discussion. And those are always, that's one of my first loves in this, uh, the whole sports performance thing. So thanks for being on the show today. You are very welcome. My pleasure, Joel. So tell me a little bit about uh, what drew you to like jump testing and that element and jumping and plyometrics and that whole realm of sports science and sport performance. Yeah, good question. Um, I think for me, I probably, like most people in our profession, I started strength and conditioning um, as more of a strength guy than anything else. I had a, bit, a little bit of a background in weightlifting. And I was really lucky, you know, early on in my coaching career to get exposed to good integrated plyometric training in a professional rugby program that I was involved in. I probably have to give a lot of thanks there to uh, Dr. Tom Cummins, who um, was a uh, sprinter who worked for Munster Rugby. I worked part-time with him for, for a season and, and that probably started me down the right path. And at the time I was doing a PhD in the area of kind of rehabilitation after ACL injury. And the main focus of that was around the restoration of stretch shortening cycle qualities after ACL reconstruction. So it was probably in the course of that PhD, I, I probably wasn't that interested in the ACL side of it, but Doing research allowed me to go off on little tangents and to collaborate with people like Tom. And the interest, I guess, that grew for me was around more of stretch shortening cycle function and its relationship to performance, plyometrics, jump training, and the like. So you said something interesting right off the bat that got me thinking. I feel like I don't think any I've heard any strength coaches who are like, yeah, I, I started doing all speed and plyometrics. And then later, I really got into weightlifting. You know, it's always... It's always I started with a lot of weightlifting and then I got into, you know, X, Y, Z. <laughs> I was just thinking I don't often hear it the other way around. So No, I think yeah, I think me. the exception to that is people who who find their way into uh, strength and conditioning because they, they come from a track athletics background and they offer so much value to teams where most of the staff are from the background that that you've described. And so it was almost the other way around for me. I probably got my one of those first kind of good paying part-time gigs because I had kind of a weightlifting specific experience and that complemented a strength and conditioning team at the time that was a sprinter and a conditioning guy, you know, a, an endurance athlete and a sprinter. So they were well covered with both ends of uh, the energy system spectrum, but they maybe had a little bit of a gap in terms of the strength coaching. And that's probably where I got my in at the time. I got, I got you. Yeah, I know, like you said, like the track thing, I know for me, I, I definitely started with track, but then also had a huge you know passion for strength since a young, young age. And then I've almost gone, I come, I kind of went away from it a little bit, but I'm, I'm almost coming back into it with new eyes now with a lot of like Bill Hartman's principles and what Pat Davidson is talking about that stuff. And that's kind of reignited a lot of interest mm -hmm. in my level. So maybe it's been like in a little roller coaster, like down and then up again. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting as well to me, you, you talked about how it started with the stretch shortening cycle. So it almost kind of started like micro to macro in that sense, like starting from more um, like almost like a theoretical and then working outwards, would, would you say? I think I was really lucky because at that time I was, like I said, working in the applied sense with this professional rugby team. But on the other side, I was starting down the pathway of a PhD. So I think I was really lucky in that I had both at the same time. I was, I was seeing a practitioner who, who, who I respected massively and who was a couple of years further down the line with his PhD. I was seeing him put things into practice while studying at that kind of more micro level on the other side. So I think I was really lucky in that I had exposure to, to both ends of the spectrum there almost. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things I'm really going to enjoy chatting with you about particularly is I tend to not look at the data that you're get that we're getting all that much. I mean, I don't have force plates anyways, but just that's always been something that I've really leaned on people who are doing that and compiling those things and looking at research. So 
I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about how like a lot of these plyometric principles we have in the questions manifest themselves from some of the things that you're looking at from more of a, a quantitative standpoint. So I'll start with this question is based off the sports you work with currently or the, the athlete populations you're testing out. And cause, and this may, might differ from sport to sport, but maybe just in general, like what does the ultimate athlete look like from a plyometric perspective? Like what are they doing really well? And what are you seeing show up on the force plate really well with, I guess, what you would call the ultimate athlete? Yeah, I suppose the first thing I'd probably qualify a little bit is I think when we're talking about jump testing and, and stuff like that, I, I like to keep things pretty simple. So while I might have access to tools like force plates, when I think about jump testing, I'm more thinking about incredibly simple metrics and I'm more thinking about variety of different jumps rather than these incredibly in-depth metrics from a single jump. And I think that's maybe a, a direction that, that the field can go in sometimes that we get too singularly focused on a single jump, but we try and get really in-depth on the metrics. I'm not really, I'm kind of moving away from that. Mm. Anyway, in terms of the ultimate athlete, that's a great question. And it's a really difficult question mm. <laughs> to start with. I guess for me, I think the beauty of like looking at athletes' plyometric ability is that for me, there is no one way to do things. There is no ultimate because ultimately what it's about is performance. It's about outcome, how fast you can run, how far you can throw, how long you can go for, whatever it is. It's about outcome. It's about performance outcome. And there is an infinite number of ways to achieve that. Um, so even if you even if you talk about ply, you know, the ultimate plyometric athlete, um, I even think there's multiple ways that athletes can express those plyometric outcomes. You know, you're going to have athletes who are more elastic, you know, those athletes that you see just bounce down the field or bounce down the track. You're going to have athletes who are a little bit more dependent on like their contractile function, a little bit more force dominant. So I think the beauty for me of plyometric training as well as plyometric assessment is that it allows you to see maybe what athletes' preferences are, how they achieve a given outcome, and that can maybe give you some clues as to how you should train them or how you should facilitate their performance. Yeah, so that actually, and I hope I had this on the question list somewhere. I don't want to spring a question out of the blue, but as you it's talk okay. about that, I this to me is is something that I've been thinking about lately in the sense of how much do you want to hit an athlete's weaknesses? And so, and I'm, I'm glad you also said too, like, you know, there's no, an athlete like who's a more muscular athlete might have like a wide infrasternal angle. Like that athlete might like prefer longer ground contact times, whereas an elastic athlete might prefer less and who has a different structure too. They have maybe have a narrow rib cage or infrasternal angle and they're just shaped differently. So how much do you want to train those athletes' weaknesses? Because I think if you asked me like 10, you know, 15 years ago or something, I might have said oh well you should just train the other way or something get trained what you're missing or something or so in terms of both like health and not getting hurt and then just all high performance how much do you want to actually address what an athlete isn't good at yeah good question i i don't think there's a simple answer but i think in terms of addressing weaknesses i guess one of the first things i would do in that regard is just look to see if there's any real low-hanging fruit and so I guess if you maybe you're basing it on group analysis or you're basing on what you've seen over time. But I think if you feel that there's really some areas there where it's not so much a, wish, a weakness as like a real deficiency, well, then I think you want to get after that. So, you know, that might be that you're looking at, you know, in, in large groups of athletes, you're maybe looking at correlations and, and within your teams or your groups, you're looking at what metrics might be correlated with the speed outcome that you want or the performance outcome that you want. Or it might be that you're looking at an individual athlete's profile with respect to the group or respect to, with respect to some historical norms that you've established. And I think in those cases, if you've got real deficiencies, you know, you've, you've got something that you just think is, is too far away from the norm or a, an appropriate standard, then, then I think you want to get after those things. But I think besides that, I think you're looking at an athlete's profile. You're, you're learning a little bit more about uh, how they achieve their given outcomes. And you're using that to try and guide and inform you about what type of athlete they might be and what type of athlete and uh, what type of training they might respond to. So, you know, you're not going to change that, that strength dominant athlete you described into an incredibly bouncy, springy, elastic animal. But again, if you're seeing some real deficiencies in their ground contact times when they run or their contact times when they perform hopping tasks or 
uh, the way they move in certain tests or assessments, then if you're seeing real deficiencies, then I think you need to turn your attention to those and try and address them because often they are, like I said, just low hanging fruit and you've got some easy wins that you could potentially pick up on there. Yeah, I like how you just term it low hanging fruit because I guess I would think of like a muscular, like you said, like a, if an athlete just had a terrible hopping test, like a very muscle dominant, knee flexion dominant athlete who just had a terrible RSI or something or an elastic athlete who's maybe standing vertical or ability to actually yield and get into a jump was horrendous or something. I don't know, like maybe that's where I'm like I'm looking at. Like I look at, it, I guess, on a couple of those. One is can you get in the positions that your sport needs? And for me, even, yeah, like vertic- like just being able to sink into or drop into a vertical jump, I look at. But I'd be curious, do you, for perhaps the more muscle-dominant athlete, like an athlete who's really, a really big squatter, strong squatter, good accelerator, lots of time. I mean, is there like kind of a minimal reactive strength that they at least need to be above, you know what I'm saying? To at least maybe be above an injury threshold or hit their maximal abilities that you've seen in terms of your testing or thoughts about that? Yeah, I think I think I think you could definitely think about some of these tests as like minimum standard tests. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. if they're not above a certain threshold with respect to, like I said, what you've seen historically or, or their teammates or players of similar positions, then you might want to get after those physical qualities. But in some of the examples that you've given there, sometimes you know you're just going to get false false negatives too. You know, so you'll get athletes with really poor counter movement jumps or really poor reactive strength scores. And sometimes you know the, the first thing I will think of is can they actually do the test? Do they actually know how yeah. to do the test? Do they actually understand what I'm asking for or what we're looking at here? And so I wouldn't jump in at the deep end off the basis of you know, a first intake and a first set of poor results because sometimes just cueing them better, just explaining it to them better, just demonstrating it better might actually fix things. I'd be reluctant to throw out like numbers in terms of reactive strength, even though people ask for that all the time, because it's a little bit less standardized than something like vertical jumps. Because I think the, you know, the device you use to measure as well as the surface on which you perform the tests can be quite variable in terms of their impact on the output. So I could say, oh, you know, really, you, you know, basic, you know, for field sport athletes, we want them at a reactive strength above 1.8 as a minimum. But that might not mean much if you're testing on a different surface, if you're testing with a different device, if you're, if you're not aligned exactly. So I would be reluctant to throw out exact numbers. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I can get that. And I, I will say, I, I mean, I think anyone who's done a reactive strength test will see like just how, especially when you're just working with like a mat and a jump in place or hops in place, there is definitely a learning curve to that stuff. I would say that even like my reference was the just jump mat and this was 10, yeah, about a a little over 10 years ago. I got it and my four jump improved probably like 0.5 on that thing, which is, so went for maybe a two so I probably about like a two six or two seven the first time I tested it to a three four four was my top out. So I, I don't know what that is improving. It's quite a bit, way more than my like vertical or any other thing. I, like basically, what I'm saying is, as I increased on the mat from that l- low score to the high score, all my other abilities definitely did not <laughs> increase by yeah. that much. Like it was just a lot yeah. of that was just very specifically, and and even beyond. I I believe even beyond just the specific like proper reception jumping in place and knowing how much how high to jump. I I almost feel like too like my body manipulated itself. I feel like I probably internally rotated harder or really cut the pressure in my like pelvic floor harder just to just to hit that test. But and that's those yeah. You probably probably become almost like maybe more like a hammer than a than a spring. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you just start to like just yeah just attack the ground way above a, a level of intent that you can use in any kind of natural or relaxed sporting activity. Yeah. And that's why um, I, I put this question in here and it was kind of vague and that's basically what is and what isn't stiffness. But given that example, I just gave you how far, and, and you said it back when we started, like you don't want to take one test or one or two tests and just dig, dig, dig into those. You, know, you want to do maybe a more of a spectrum. So Based on the context of what I just said, like, or like a reactive strength, how do you, would you, do you see stiffness in context or the reactive strength in context of what the athlete is actually doing in situations that require a lot of force and a little amount of time in their sport? Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's about not putting too much importance on a, on a single metric or a single test. And it's also about not just looking at the number at the other end of the test, but what you're seeing with your eyes at the same mm. time. 
So again, I, I think these reactive strength tests can be quite useful, quite meaningful, but you want to be looking at them alongside the, the sporting outcome, the speed scores, the, the concentric only jumping, the counter movement jumping. And so they become just one point, one data point on your, your sports science report, or they become one, one little kernel in your brain of, of your coaching eye. And so I think like, again, if you put too much emphasis on these tests, athletes will do exactly what you've described. You know, they'll, they'll, I wouldn't say cheat the test, but they'll, they'll do everything it takes to get a better score. And that may not actually be conducive to developing a physical quality that's going to help them in their sports performance. Um, so I think it's just about keeping these things, you know, only doing them as much as you need to, only putting as much importance on them as you need to, uh, and only seeing them as one small piece in a, in a much bigger picture from a coaching perspective or a data analysis perspective, you know, because it's like, a, I'm not sure where the, the quote or the saying comes from, but, you know, as people say, you know, as soon as you make something a test, it ceases to be an effective test because people start to try and do everything just to get better at it. So I think you've got to keep these things, use them sparingly, use them when you need to, place them in context, but also trust your eyes more than the number that you're getting out on the other side. Yeah, I, I love that in terms of not make it, yeah, because as soon as you make it a test, like that's what I've done personally in my own experience as an athlete is... I all the the tests I have my athletes do I just yeah I do and I try to get really good at them <laughs> and I in the process of getting really good at like a four jump or even like even a standing jump on the 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 jump mat or even taking it a step further even just doing like serial hurdle hops or single leg hurdle hops I found that I was actually getting better at those plyometrics than I was actually like I my hurdle hops would go up significantly but my running jumps didn't get a whole lot better respectively it's kind of like once you get, I think that's what this is with anything. It's with weightlifting. It's with multi throws or whatever you're doing. You once you go too far into that little thing at the expense of your actual sports skill, you might start to pull everything with it a little bit. And I think I got so good at some of that stuff. It, I, it just and, and the more I um, I don't want to keep dragging on my point here, but I I know the more I've learned from Adarian Barr about like just getting into all the little nuances that go into all these sport biomechanics and skills, you realize that just one jump style is not going to cover all those little points that are coming out in the sport biomechanics either. There's a lot of little really important subtle differences. And especially once you're talking about carrying momentum into a movement that are really, is really important. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, I think when we think about performing plyometric training or running jump tests or plyometric type tests, you know, we're still doing work that sits on the, the general end of the spectrum you know from general mm -hmm. to specific um and i think you know, for me that the jump testing is really useful and maybe it's because of that 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 history or that bias i have as a as a strength guy more than anything else but you know we, we it's difficult to assess um, or to know if the general work we're doing like general strength for example is having an effect on that highly specific sports performance so we almost i think kind of use you know jump testing and plyometrics work as we use it as some of our transfer training work mm. and we use it as some of our assessment work to try and see, well, okay, look, if, if the work I'm doing in the weight room isn't making me jump a little higher, bounce a little faster, then it's very unlikely to be having an effect on the more complex sports skills with their nuanced biomechanics that you've described. So for me, it's almost like an intermediate kind of step. You know, If we can't move the dial on some of these gener general physical properties, then we're not going to have a huge effect on the sport specific outcome, I don't think. But similarly, like you've described, you know, once we do start moving the dial on some of these jump metrics and jump performances, there's going to be probably some benefit on the sport specific side of things, but only to a point. You know, the more developed we get in a general sense, the more the returns are going to be diminishing on that sports performance outcome. Um, and that's at the point at which we need to get a little bit more clever, uh, a little bit more nuanced with our sports specific training. Yeah. And that's where I think the field, you know, athletic performance or whatever you want to call it, I think it is, or it definitely has been historically kind of polarized, like in the sense of like, mm -hmm. okay, we're general and then everything else is the sport coach's domain. And, but I think, you know, sprinting and jumping are very <laughs> relevant to 
what an athlete, especially if you're in a jumping sport, you know, your jumping, you know, abilities or your, your running technique or abilities is pretty uh, relevant. And so I think that is where I think about Bonder Chuck's pyramid of you have the competitive exercise at the top, the actual mm-hmm. thing. And then you have in descending order, you have the special developmental below that's closer and the special preparatory. And I would almost, and then you have general at the bottom, which is just like basic circuit training and body weight circuit training. And yep. I think that, I think it's easy to think that plyometrics are, they're not the actual thing, but they would be the second one down. But I think they're almost the third one down in many no, I, cases. Yeah, I, I, would, I, yeah, I mean, I, I probably don't think about these things being as, not to argue with Bondarchuk or anything, sure. but I probably don't think about these as being such different categories. Like I, I do kind of view things as more of a spectrum and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's all highly contextual. You know, uh, one exercise might be incredibly general for one sport, but it might be more specific for another sport or action. But no, again, I would agree with you. A lot of, I think, the, the broad plyometrics we do fall closer to the general end of the spectrum than the specific. I'd like to take a break from the show to share with you a significant pendulum that has swung in my own personal training practice. So between my mid-20s and mid-30s, I was this veritable pre-workout fiend. I ha- was in this place where I absolutely had to have a pre-workout before every training session. And after just seeing kind of the adrenal response flatline that that created, amongst other things, at age 35, I've been sick of that that idea for a few years. I hadn't been taking pre-workouts for a few years, and I've been starting to get into um, more of uh, Logan Christopher's like mental training, he- uh, hypnosis prior to training sessions. I love that so much, I started to get into the products of his company, Lost Empire Herbs. So the first herb formula that I got was the Phoenix formula. This is far different from that generic bottle of Jinko Biloba that you might see at the drugstore. As Logan says, these are are not your grandfather's herbs. This earthy and immaculately well-sourced compound, uh, my first dose of it, I felt this unique and subtle tingle through my whole body. And I instantly knew that I was onto something that was really going to change the way I looked at this portion of my training and well-being. Within two weeks of using the Phoenix formula, honestly, my lifts had gone up 10 to 15 pounds, my big lifts. Fast forward a few more months, and at age 35, I had hit the highest vertical jump I had hit in really about the last four to five years. I know herbalism was a really big and important part of that, and it's a really big and important part of my life and well-being today. I love what Lost Empire Herbs is doing, and I'm thrilled to have them as a sponsor of this show since I'm a user and believer in their products, and as we live in this increasingly chemical-filled world, they shine such a bright light on using the power of nature to help us become stronger and more resilient human beings. So if you want to get a hold of this herbal supplementation to boost your own performance, head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly, and you can see my own personal top recommended herbs that I use, including shiliagit resin, as you may have heard Grant Fowler talk about on a recent show, and then get 15% off that purchase. So again, head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly, that's J-U-S-T-F-L-Y, and you can go ahead and see my top recommended herbs and get 15% off your purchase. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, so with that in mind, you said you had gotten away from just doing like one test. So could you explain to me maybe some of the the key, like in the battery of tests you do give, talk a little bit about why one group, you may give them a particular series of tests or put relevance on a particular series versus another group. I mean, I, this could be a long talk, but uh, just... <laughs> well, I'll try and keep it a little bit short. Yeah, get into that um, a little bit. Well, I think I think you've touched on the most important thing there, first of all, which is there shouldn't be a standard battery that you just use with everybody. It's got to be about what is the problem in front of you? What's the question that you're trying to answer? What's the performance problem that you're trying to solve or contribute towards? That has to sit at the forefront. And so I think that's where I would start. What's the question here? What problem is the coach or the athlete hoping that I might be able to help them solve? Then you're thinking about the demands of the sport. And that leads you down the pathway of, dynamic correspondence you know you're going to have different associations between different tests and different sports performance or sports activities based on like the muscle groups involved the joint actions the contraction types you know the time period of force application involved the intent of effort involved you know the direction of force application relative to the center of mass so i think i think it kind of depends on okay why am i doing this test And what aspect of sports performance do I hope it might be associated with? So, yeah, so I I think it's a big, it depends, but but, but what it depends on is 
those key questions. What problem am I trying to solve or contribute towards? Um, and what do I think the the biomechanical similarities are between the sport and the, the jump test that I'm that I'm looking to use? So if the problem is, you know, an athlete who has a history of stress fracture, an athlete who is, let's say, a middle distance runner, and the coach is looking for them to be a little bit more economical on the track, they have a history of stress fracture, for example, well, then the coach isn't happy about the way they sit into their their running pattern. He wants them to be a little bit higher, let's say. Well, then we might be looking at reactive strength type tests. We might be looking at unilateral testing because maybe there's a history of of, of lower limb injury there. But I wouldn't see much value in, in that example of using concentric only squat jumps where the athlete sits mm-hmm. into a low position. I probably wouldn't even see a huge amount of value in using vertical jumps or counter movement jumps because that's not the performance quality that the coach is trying to positively influence, for example. On the other end of the spectrum, we might be talking about field sport athletes where early acceleration and change of direction is a big focus. Well, then we might be looking at some of those high rate of force development activities like concentric only squat jumps, which probably are a little bit more associated with early phase acceleration. Hmm. So I don't want to use it depends as a cop out. I use it, the, the term it depends because I think there's a number of different areas where you're trying to join the dots, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. So maybe just um, maybe we can get into this those two examples because they are pretty different, right? Like a, a rugby player versus a middle distance runner who's had a stress fracture history. I mean, those are pretty different ends of the spectrum there and different basically situations too <laughs> where if you threw one in the other sport, they would probably not fare very well. And so, well, although I imagine there's some rugby players that can hit a decent middle distance time, but so with um, like a explosive acceleration athlete, you're, are you really putting a, a premium at least again, not trying to make the test like something you do all the time, but concentric vertical jump power. So just being able to sit there from a dead stop and exploding out of that, like that's a, that's a pretty key metric for a sport that would require that type of situation. Yeah. I think like even something as simple as hundred meter sprint. Sorry, not to say that it's simple, but I think we think, you know, the, the lay person, and I'll include myself as a lay person in this context, looks at that and thinks, well, it's, it's just running in a straight line very fast. So it's simple in that sense. But you still have very discrete phases that are dependent on very different physical qualities. So, you know, your squat jump, uh, your maximal strength, your, your squat jump, concentric only squat jump might give you a little bit more insight into some of those 200 to 400 millisecond rate of force development qualities that might be a little bit more representative of what you do in early acceleration, your, your, your vertical jump or your counter movement jump, slow stretch shortening cycle activity might be a little bit more indicative of general athleticism. Your reactive strength type tests might be a little bit more representative of late phase or, or top, late phase acceleration or top speed running. So you know, again, even I think in a in a single example like that, you probably still would be using a variety of tests to get different insights into that particular athlete's makeup or their particular preferences of muscular contraction. Sure. So this is, I think this is interesting is if I, I think of things in terms of tiers of like maybe how much equipment do I have available if I have a group of athletes, yeah. maybe tier zero is a stopwatch. And then mm-hmm. tier two is maybe a timing system or a timing system that gives me a few different splits, 10, 20, 30 meters. And then tier mm-hmm. three would be, I have you know, force plates and things. I feel like, do you feel like really that, I, I, I like the 80, 20 rule, like you get, you know, 80% or else from 20%. And like, if you just, if all you have was a stopwatch and just like ran, yeah, like a, a 40 yard dash, a hundred meter, I guess it'd be longer, longer might be better if all you had is a stopwatch because there's that error in the shorter distances. But I mean, how much do you think you're really covering of the whole pie by being able to do some of those lower level training means? You know what I'm saying? Like by a, just a simple, like running a 40 with splits or 30 with splits or a stopwatch sprint time, how much do you feel like um, are you getting out of that versus how, how important is it in the grand scheme of things being able to get all the kind of the bells and whistles and the, the different, like getting in tune, the, the tuning with the jump tests and things, do you feel? Yeah, I think... I think it's about, I mean, I think a, an 80 20 type split, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. And, you know, like I said, just with, just with your timing gates or your stopwatch, you're going to know who your really good accelerators are, who your, who your really good top speed guys are. You're going to be able to 
bracket athletes and understand athletes on those bases alone. I guess I think for me, what one of the values of jump testing for me is simplification mm. in that when we use simple jump tests, you know, with hands on hips um, and we just look at simple metrics like height. So we're using your just jump mat or you're using a you know, simple measuring tool. One of the things that you're doing there compared with running as fast as possible in a straight line is that you're simplifying and you're narrowing down the degrees of freedom. So I think you are getting a picture, a closer picture to the, maybe like the, the physical qualities rather than a greater kind of confluence of physical quality and technical execution that you would get in top speed running, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, while I think in your mind, you're almost thinking the jump testing adds complexity in my mind, it almost adds simplicity because you're taking these very simple tests or very simple movements with low degrees of freedom. There's only so many ways you can do them and you're getting simple outcomes like a jump height or a reactive strength mm. value. And so because of that, I think you're, you're maybe getting a truer representation of the physical characteristics as opposed to the performance characteristics. I, I tell you what, you, what you just said there, Reminded me, I love that, by the way. And I think I would have hated if I was like you know, playing soccer or basketball and, and you were making me put my hands on my hips and do a squat jump only, I would have probably cried. I wouldn't have cried, but I, my <laughs> ego would have taken a hit, man, because that is not my jam compared to some other things that I've been able to do as an athlete. But I, I like that because I appreciate the fact that if it also isn't something you get to train often, it's kind of this marker of if your general abilities are going up. Which I, I'm thinking that's where you're getting. Like, it's just knowing that the raw power, the raw concentric power, the the muscle, and, and your ability to coordinate that kind of went up in that situation. And it's not you didn't tech, you know, squeak something out with your arms or rotating your you know legs a certain way. It's just I, I and I appreciate that. And I when I was working at Cal with swimmers, one of my favorite things that I felt. I mean, this didn't make the swimmer, but it was almost just me seeing where their battery was at and their power was at was the Kaiser jumper and just doing mm -hmm. squat jumps on a Kaiser jumper because I always felt like an athlete could improve their lifts, their squats or cleans or anything else you did that had that was complex and multi-joint and you had learned as a skill. Like you could get better at that just by the skill of that lift or that movement. But I always felt like that that Kaiser jumper there's not a lot of skill in going up and down with the pneumatic weight. It was just, it was, it's what it was. And it really did seem like as people got better at that, that really seemed to correlate more with their improvement in the water. Again, not, but I think it was, they got better at that Kaiser jumper too, because they were just getting stronger as an organism. Like everything was getting, but their swimming was probably making them better at it just because they were maturing and improving and getting better. And so that, I feel like that was my version of it in a rough roundabout way. But I never yeah, that Maybe I didn't think about it. Remember, I made that connection, though, to what you were talking no, think, about until now. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess, I guess for me, you know, in your case, it might be the Kaiser. In other cases, it might be simple jump tests. Ultimately, you're trying to find out, like, what type of adaptation have we accrued from the physical training that we did? Because we didn't back squat to get better at the back squat. Mm -hmm. And we didn't power clean to get better at the power clean. We, we chose those exercises because we were hoping they would elicit some kind of physical change some kind of change in physical quality and if we could have clicked our fingers and had that change in physical quality anyway we never would have back squatted to begin with and that's definitely the trap that i've been in and i probably still am in at times strength matters strength is important but it's so easy to measure and it's relatively easy to actually improve in athletes yeah. that we can get a little bit fixated on that and it's easy to show demonstrable progress it looks good on reports and you can justify your pay grade. <laughs> but it, like I said before, if, you're, if that strength isn't transferring into these simple low degrees of freedom jump tests, then you can be pretty damn sure it's not transferring into the complex sports skills that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I love that. Um, a show that's going to go out before this one uh, was with Angus Bradley. And we were talking about how when athletes get better at lifts, a lot of that is just because they learn to manage their internal pressures better, or maybe they learn to compress, like, you know, to anteriorly tilt their, tilt their pelvis as a result of that pressure and compress their spinal column better. <laughs> you know, things that allow you to brace under the weight. And yeah, the, the bar mm -hmm. went up, but that doesn't mean that 
that pattern is not a good pattern for the sport and dynamic movement. It's good for being under a heavy bar. And yes, there are positive mm-hmm. adaptations that come out of it. But we were talking about kind of that point where you realize that the lift was getting better because of you're just getting better at managing these compressive strategies that are very specific to that weight. Not even fast twitch or slow twitch, just the way the body is shifting its shape to deal with this. And so it almost, I had this funny thought, like it would be almost, you could call it like depressing metrics for strength coaches. Cause it's like, <laughs> we have to actually look at the end of the year, what actually went up with these really super simple, super raw points <laughs> that, and yeah, cause if we talk of what actually ends up transferring out, it's, it's, you know, what, what is it exactly? Even Dan John, when he was on here a few uh, shows ago, had said, has anyone proven what actually makes you throw farther and this is throwing like he was talking discus or shot put what actually Mm -hmm. specifically transfers from weightlifting to shot and disc because we know it does for those sports for sure 100 percent. but what is it actually (laughs) like and and i just think it's the body is so complex but to be able to take it back to what did these raw metrics improve that are real simple and you can't cheat it uh are really important how, how often, by the way, do you test those like concentric only jumps for that? I mean, again, I'm getting hung up on one population here, but I think it's easy to oh, talk yeah, about. Oh, yeah. So but... that, yeah, I mean, I probably, again, again, it completely depends. I mean, I probably have, uh, one of the biggest things it's going to depend on is what's the relative amount of access do you have to your athletes? You know, I'm not mm-hmm. going to waste a huge amount of time taking jump tests and jump scores if I'm only seeing the athletes once a week, once every couple of weeks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or, you know, so, or if it's a big group of athletes, you know, again, it's, you just lose too much coaching time and training time if you're trying to do this stuff all the time. You know, so in those big group environments, you know, it's maybe that you're doing a battery that you've mm-hmm. decided upon every three months, every quarter, beginning of the end of it, every major training block. And maybe there's one key thing. So maybe in that group, you've decided that reactive strength is the physical quality that you're getting after and maybe you're testing that a little bit more often because it fits nicely into mm. the end of your warm-up or you have the equipment where you can do it quickly and efficiently so it, it would depend on some of those kind of contexts if it is that individual athlete that you're working with you have a lot of time with them and it's a training block where you really you really are hoping to have a positive effect on some of the physical qualities that you think you can identify through a jump test or a number of jump tests, then there might be one or two tests that you are running on a weekly basis. And some of them fit in really well into standardized warm-ups anyway. You know, so I, mm-hmm. I, it's pretty easy. You, you mentioned a four-hop test or a 10-hop or a reactive strength test. A lot of the time, that kind of stuff can fit in really nicely at the end of a warm-up. And it can be pretty quick and easy just to get somebody into an opto-jump area or to put a accelerometer type device on them or just to get them on the jump mat and just at the end of their weekly warm-up their daily warm-up they just bash out their test set you don't look at the data too much they move on and complete their session but then that is something that you know you can retrospectively look at on a week-to-week basis and i find that really useful is when you do end up with that type of data to do a little bit like i love i love that idea you said of those depressing metrics for strength coaches (laughs) you get to the end of your eight-week block and you now have the opportunity to think, okay, well, well, was the progression in the physical quality what I expected week on week over eight weeks? Uh, and oftentimes it wasn't. <laughs> um, but at least that allows you to have a, a hard conversation with yourself or to look at your program critically or just to learn something new about your athlete that you didn't know before. I think one of the most important things when you think about frequency of any test is that the more often you test the less influence you're going to have from just like noise. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if you test very infrequently, let's say once, you know, in week one and once again in week 12, the relative effect of any noise in those tests is quite high. I guess what I mean Mm. by noise is, you know, you you catch catch the athlete on a bad day. They haven't slept well the night before. They misinterpret your cue on that day. They warm up in a slightly different way. If you only have two, two data points, and you have a little bit of noise in one of them, and has a big effect on your perception of the results. If you have a lot of data points, it doesn't matter too much if there's noise in any of those data points because you're seeing a pretty strong trend across multiple weeks, multiple exposures, multiple viewings of the athlete. So I think that's important to have in the back of your mind as well. So I will tend, the, the short version of that long answer I gave you, I would tend to maybe have a bigger battery of things I will do you know, maybe every three months 
but I might have one or two key tests for an athlete that I am trying to run more often to to get a more live picture of what they're doing over time. Cool. So I'd like to get into maybe out of the lab a little bit, so to speak, and maybe into uh, what some of the batteries, like the actual plyometric tra- training implementations might look like to attempt to uh, improve some of these raw metrics. So mm-hmm. for example, maybe let's talk first about a team that needs, you know, there's, there's a need for reactive strength. Maybe you're training a volleyball team or a basketball team, and there's a, a reactive strength need that's present. And then there's also in context of knowing that a running jump is not a standing jump. Because this is something I've been thinking about more as I start to unwind the complexity of actual running jumps. And I think about how the plyometrics fit in. But what does your plyometric implementation look like when there's a reactive strength demand and, and you're looking to improve that? Um, so, I, so I guess you, you're kind of asking here, like, what does the training look like? Yeah, exactly. Sorry, simply put, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess for me, I probably think of the training in kind of like four... I would say kind of broad, four probably broad like categories. And depending on, you know, some, sometimes depending on the jump testing or but mo- mostly depending on the athlete that's in front of me, we might start at phase one and we may never get beyond phase two, mm-hmm. or we might start at phase three and maybe move to phase four. And those, those broad phases for me is that kind of foundational phase. And there may not be actually any plyometric work in that foundation phase that might be where we're just working on basic foot ankle calf strength and mm. uh, we're maybe working on like foot ankle control and posture and uh, we might be doing like some really low level low intensity but fast hopping in these kind of phases the progression from there for me would be into more kind of development work where we might be doing a little bit more moderate intensity fast stretch shortening cycle activities we probably have an emphasis on like shorter contact times but we'd probably be not too focused on the jump height in those tasks. So we wouldn't be too focused on output. We'd be a little bit more focused on, I want to say, um, being relaxed, having rhythm, yes. having tempo, having ground contacts in the right kind of area, right, right kind of time zone. Uh, and in that phase, we'd also probably be working a little bit on like the direction of the force application. So we might be using some general drills, but also some specific drills for the sport where you are looking at your foot position with respect to the center of mass. You are looking at how the direction in which you're applying force relative to the center of mass. And you're using that phase two, I think, to build up tolerance as well. So you have a wide variety of activities here uh, and you'd be trying to develop some endurance um, and using those more kind of extensive methods. And then the third phase for me would that be that real kind of realization phase. We're using high intensity, fast stretch shortening cycle activities, real emphasis on short contact times, but also on output and jump height. So these would be your real like low volume, maximal effort activities. And, uh, you know, you would be, you know, it's that real intensification phase. And then depending on, on, on the problem you're trying to solve, you maybe do then have a fourth phase where you're trying to select exercises and modify exercises to optimize that transfer of training a little bit more. So it's almost like your, your realization exercises with that slightly more sport-specific slant on them. But again, for me, the, 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 the really important thing here, that, that makes it sound so easy that you just do step one, step two, step mm-hmm. three, step four, and you win a medal. In practice, it's not like that. It's messy. It's chaotic. Mm -hmm. You know, we might be doing some phase one work and some phase four work for some for certain reasons. You might have some athletes who never really get beyond phase two because of their specific needs or other complexities around their training weeks. And there'll always be overlap between these these sections as well, if that makes sense. And and I guess if if what I'm describing, I think what I'm describing is not a is not a unique system. It's not a you know, it's not a it's not a patented training system. It's it's just the general principles of exercise selection and exercise progression. Yeah, one of the back to what you said about phase two, I, I really like that is and I think it's oftentimes overlooked is you talked about relaxation and rhythm. And I see so often this is just something I personally think that a lot of coaches in the field don't look at is do you look at the expression on your athlete's face when they're doing a movement, <laughs> you know? And mm-hmm. then 
do, if they're gra- you know straining or uh, grinding it out, or they're, do you think that that face in a competition or or a challenging you know situation competition is going to help them? And you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, I, I I've always kind of had that in my system, I guess, when when working with athletes. You know, track coaches always say, you know, relax or whatever, and I, I think there's a bandwidth to that. You can't relax. You can't be a wet noodle. You know, running the hundred, mm-hmm. but. Lately, I've gone back into my own, and I've had bounding complexes in my, I've been using them with athletes for probably about 15 years now since I first read about them when Ver- the Verkashansky text likes doing alternate leg bounding, a left, left, right, right, a left, 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 right, 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 single leg, and those types of things have been my favorite. But something that I've gotten to recently is the idea, and I would say I changed this about three years ago, my programming is is taking, it used to be back 10 years ago, it was like that overly like, you know, fiery young phase of my coaching where everything was max, you know, it's like, all right, we're going to use bounding complexes and go as far as you can, everyone. And, da, da, da. and now I would say about three, four years ago, I scaled them back to say, oh, it's about, you know, a lot of times it's 80%, it's light, you know, feels smooth. And now I've even gotten the point in, in doing this in my own training, because I think I tend to do this first and then, you know, start assigning it, but doing it literally to just scan the body for tension patterns <laughs> I, and because I've picked up a lot of them over time I and I don't even realize it until I actually start digging in but just say hey you're going to do this set of bounding and you're only doing it to be like as smooth as possible and try to find muscle tension and find a way to eliminate that like bad like obviously like bad muscle tension like in the, like the neck or shoulders not obviously you have to have tension but hope you know what I'm saying anyways all, all I'm saying is I, I really I think that's overlooked the the rhythm and the smoothness elements and so i just think that i mean athletes are going to get hard training all the time and you're an athlete you're going to get these and it's not hard to put an intense method in but if you never go back to finding a relaxed way to do that intense method and turn off the right muscles at the right time then you're gonna i think athletes carry a lot of noise with them you mentioned the noise idea they, they carry that noise inherently with them when they do get into like as they go through those harder phases of things. So I, I think that I really like that idea of those relaxed, like a relaxed phase or, or whatever you're calling it there. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, like you're describing, I would say that the, the exact problem that I've definitely had as, like we said at the start, that coach who has come from more of a strength background than a, an athletics or track and field type background Um, and I think that is the default mistake that a lot of us in inverted commas can make it's easy to look at plyometric work and to fall into the same reps and sets and intensities that we use for back squat and power cleans you know because it's relatively easy to do you know if we're talking about things like reactive strength and jump mats or force plates or whatever you can measure it it's measurable so it's very easy and I've definitely been very guilty of it. And I think I probably continue to be. It's very easy to fall into that. Right? I'm, I'm going straight to the realization phase. I'm going to do these plyometrics. I'm going to do them hard. I'm going to do them. I'm going to measure them. And I'm going to show progression over time. But that is, I think, where you f- become likely to fall into that trap you described at the beginning of this conversation, where you're just training for the test and you're just winding yourself up into a uh, a state of tension that isn't actually particularly productive or transferable into the sport. But I think where it requires, like as a strength and conditioning coach, when when you're maybe not delivering a huge amount of the sport specific stuff, it requires some bravery, I think, to use your training time for some of that submaximal stuff that is more a little that is a little bit more about feel, posture, being relaxed, the right force in the right direction. It requires a little bit of bravery to take that route because it's not as measurable and it's a little bit more it's a little bit more subjective for the athletes too yeah that was fantastically well put (laughs) i i love it i think it just yeah as as a field the athletic performance field is very we have to have numbers to show that we're doing something and and obviously the easiest way to do that is just lifts go up i mean that's kind of what makes that that a lot of the industry go around in a sense but it takes like you said it's a lot of bravery to kind of go to the other side of things. And I mean, they're both, it's not that one or the other is better. They're just both important. And if there's never a time where you're not focusing on the art of it and how an athlete actually moves, which does set up things to be better down the line, you just oftentimes have to be patient a little bit. It's just, I think we're just so inclined to, yeah. And I, even too, in the track and field world, there's, 
I wouldn't say they're notorious, but I've talked with multiple coaches about different coaches at different programs. You know, maybe it's a throws coach here, maybe it's a sprint coach there who get output. Like they build champions. But then those champions were done. Like after they left that program, they didn't do anything. Like they were just, they were all used up. So it's like, yeah, like a coach who knows what they're doing and, and knows how to breed that environment and get that output can do it. You can do it. But what's that athlete going to have in a few years? You know, and are they going to be injured a lot along the way too? Mm-hmm. You see that a lot of times. So I just, I, I love that. You got me fired up by, you know, your, <laughs> your experience on that topic because something I'm really passionate about. But I mean, I like talking about both of that's I like the numbers and I like the art of it. I'm just, I'm intrigued by both, but I. And, and I think we all have our biases and we all have probably like a, a disposition that we can fall into. And my disposition would definitely be to fall in on the other side. It would be to fall towards the numbers, the measurable, the stuff that I can control. That would be my bias. And I think there's some strengths in that, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to become more aware that there's some real weaknesses and some blind spots with taking that route too. Yeah. I think that that mentality is easier to pull off in sports yes. like track or swimming than strength and conditioning probably because you are like you are the the coach and you see that the the results from front to back if that makes sense like you're seeing Mm -hmm. like because you can see the athlete being in a different state in how they work with the ground versus and then you can see how that is going to manifest itself into a better time at some point and and you have to have the eye for it versus if i i guess maybe uh a world where uh, seeing uh, numerical improvements is the majority of what you do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, especially mm-hmm. when you have a lot of things to and skills to teach and learn. I just think, I mean, personally, I think it's e- a little bit easier to probably do that on a level. And maybe in a, working in a coach where that's the output and you see it and you're always around it. But I'm sure, you know, strength and conditioning coaches can certainly um, you know, do it just as well. So I'm just kind of a thought. All right. So Last, uh, I know we've we've gone a long time here. I do. Maybe we could sneak this in because I think I don't think it'll Go be too it. long of an answer. <laughs> if <laughs> I don't have a good answer, you can just edit it out. It's perfect. Yeah. So we uh, we we didn't even get to a lot of these questions, but it was great. That's okay. It's been it's been really good. But anyways, let me. Um, all right. So let me ask you this: Is be this testing or training? You can take this whatever way you want. But uh, the original question I was going to ask you was uh, like like single leg versus double leg. Uh, our reactive strength testing. I've been messing around with some single leg reactive strength t- testing a little bit recently. If I was going to do any sort of test on a single leg versus a double, does it really matter as you've seen? Um, I know we are talking specificity, but there's also angular and momentum-based specificity. So uh, just some pointers when we're talking about single versus double leg testing with athletes. Mm. Yeah, I guess we've, we've talked about specificity and degrees of freedom already. And, and I think that's the big, I think the attraction of unilateral reactive strength testing is that question of specificity. You think, well, I run, you know, one leg at a time or we do a lot of sporting activities on a single leg. So it makes sense intuitively to assess and to test in a unilateral fashion. But oftentimes I think what you gain in specificity in one area, you lose somewhere else. So for example, as soon as you go to unilateral reactive strength hopping, you'll get a big increase in contact time. So it becomes more specific in the sense of it being unilateral uh, but it becomes less specific because the contact times get longer and further away from running or whatever the sporting action that you're hoping to to link towards and i think the other big thing with with single leg activities is that there is just more degrees of freedom with them Mm -hmm. um and i guess what i mean by that is you know even if you put the hands on the hips you're still trying to move your 100% of your body weight with 50% of your legs mm-hmm. so you tend to get a lot more instability a lot more movement a lot more compensation to achieve the outcome now there's nothing wrong with that i'm not saying that we shouldn't do unilateral testing but it's about being aware of what one is giving you and the other isn't so for me you know i said before you know the bilateral stuff it's got low degrees of freedom. So it's a more of a representation of the physical quality, I think. Unilaterally, um, it's a more variable performance. So it'll, it'll give you some insight into you know, the, the element of specificity, and it'll give you some data that might help you with returning athletes from injury. Um, it'll give you some insight into between leg differences. But it is quite hard to differentiate the why when you have a change of performance, it's hard to know, did that come from, you know, the, the stiffness at the foot ankle calf complex, mm-hmm. or did it come from better 
hip stability or do they come from more trunk compensation? Um, so it's a little bit harder to unpick the changes in performance. So again, for me, wanting to keep things simple, if I want to look at like a, a raw physical quality, I'm doing that bilateral plyometric testing. If I want to capture some information that might give me some insight into symmetry, into different strategies and stabilization, um, then I might go down the route of single leg testing. But I, I suppose for me over time, I found the single leg information most valuable when I've needed it later, you know, when an athlete has gotten injured mm. and I've had retrospective single leg data to look at as benchmarks for their return from injury. I probably don't see some of those single leg vertical hopping tasks as being as closely related to performance as mm. some of the bilateral tasks. Interesting. That does make sense to me. I, I, I do think about how you can really wiggle it out for a single leg yeah. uh, test for various things. If someone didn't have a force plate, I mean, do you think there's validity in doing like from an injury prevention or balance perspective, but like a, like three forward jumps on your left leg, three forward jumps on your right. Do you think that something like that, if, and someone had a big discrepancy, like you went three feet farther on one, I mean, is that something that if you didn't have that equipment, do you think could carry some validity? Or maybe what I'm asking too is like, was there like a big imbalance between left and right? And, and, and when you retrospectively looked that you saw these, these um, leg to leg imbalances? I mean, I guess I think, I, I don't think there's any, I struggle to believe that there's any kind of like magic number with respect to symmetry yeah. that's going to lead to injury incidents because different sports and different athletes within sports, they are inherently asymmetrical sometimes. And when I mentioned PhD work previously, I mean, that's one of the things I found, you know, in the healthy control subjects that we used, they had big asymmetries too, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I, I guess when I'm talking about that unilateral versus bilateral, I am talking about that kind of measurable vertical work. Obviously, once you get into, you know, athlete exercises that have high level of dynamic correspondence to sprinting, like repeated bounds and hops, they have more of a connection more of a correlation and association with, with sports performance. In terms of the types of tests that you're talking about, I think, I think absolutely measuring single hops for distance or single hops for time, simple, repeatable, valid tests, I think they're always good to have in your back pocket. Less so to say, hey, you're going to get injured because you got 10% difference, and more so to say, okay, we know what you look like in this good moment. You're competition ready, you're healthy, we're happy with where you are. I think it's always useful to have markers of those good times so that when you get to bad times, you know what you're trying to get back towards and you, you know what relatively normal is for the athletes in front of you. Yeah. And I think that does represent the importance of record keeping in like sports performance, athletic performance, mm -hmm. just because to be able to be able to do that retrospectively and not necessarily look at absolutely everything from just pure performance outputs. Like to, it seems to me almost to, to be a good um, like injury problem solver that's where that data mining and the ability to keep records really comes yeah, in. Yeah, and I, th I think it's kind of fashionable in our industry at the moment for people to say, oh, you know, there's no point collecting data if you're not using it. And, and I understand the sentiment of that, but sometimes you don't know that you need those records. You don't mm -hmm. know that you need that data until you need it, <laughs> yeah. you know? So sometimes I think it's okay to be collecting data that just serves as a back catalog because then when you come up with the, the really important question, you've got a few more tools to help you answer that question. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. Well, hey, that, that question didn't take too long. And um, <laughs> thankfully, to our internet survived this time. So I, I'm appreciative. Yes, take yes. two. Yes. So th hey, well, that's uh, about all the time for today. Uh, I know it's late for you, but thanks so much, Eamon. I'm really happy we could make this work. And I learned a lot talking to you. So I appreciate your time. Great. Thanks, Joel. Thanks as always. That does it for another show. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll be back next week with another great guest.